So even starvation, because of our sort of globalised network, our cooperative network, has been reduced. Whereas that wasn't the case for most of human history. Most of human history is replete with examples of mass starvations, famines. And actually, those early agrarian societies were incredibly risky. Because if you go from hunting and gathering, you can eat whatever you like, you can move with the food, it's an abundance. I'll do a bushcraft talk later on and show you some wild foods around the place. And even today, you can pretty much just about live off the land. And in those days, that would have been a lot easier. And there's plenty of evidence that there's lots of abundance in those early, early environments. And, and our hunter-gatherer ancestors actually lived really well. They're probably all morbidly obese. Um, so, you know, the idea that, that, that famine and starvation is something that, that it's been there for a long time, but actually it's the agrarian society, our modern society, that kind of almost made it worse initially, but we persisted with it. We cooperated, we shared the ideas, we were convinced that this was the direction we wanted to go in, and we eroded that problem. And in the last sort of hundred years, really starvation is now, I think, a choice. There are more calories in the world than, than are needed. More people die from obesity-related diseases from too many calories than from too few. So... That was one of the major threats to, to human existence and to our ability to progress. We're now well fed. Um, and the other one is, is, of course, disease. And disease is, is one where, you know, we still face diseases. But again, you look at the examples of diseases. In my lifetime, it's been sort of AIDS, Ebola virus, uh, bird flu. And, they've, you know, they've been bad. They've been, you know, they certainly, they viscerally, we feel that we have a fear of disease. And so... Uh, but, it, but the reality is, compared to our ancestors, these diseases were you know, really not that severe. A hundred years ago, Spanish flu was wiping out between 50 and 100 million people around the world. So the idea that, that disease is, is anywhere near as vociferous and as potent a threat um, to us is, is one that we can sort of dismiss. Our ability, our, our medical cooperation, our scientific cooperation has allowed us to kind of isolate that threat. So this are, these are the things that cooperation can do. They can genuinely mitigate threats to our life, threats to humanity. And the other one is warfare. And warfare as well has also changed. You know, the, the need to, to go to war with people has changed dramatically. Um, and, and now it's really, it doesn't make much economic sense. It doesn't make any sense, really, to, to go to war with a country when you could just trade with them. So, so even that has become, through our powers of cooperation, through global trade, has been eroded. So this, is a, um, this idea of cooperation and this idea of what it means to us is, is hugely important. But for it to carry on in the future, although we will continue to attack those three problems, there needs to be a greater threat. And as luck would have it, we've created our own threat. We've created the byproduct of all of our success. Everything we've done, all of those agricultural, medical, en energy revolutions have created a byproduct, which is destroying the planet and carbonizing the atmosphere and uh, acidifying the ocean we the, the pollution of our behavior is is now the biggest threat to humanity it's overtaking us it is the fourth horseman of the apocalypse and that is the one that we can now bend our mind towards so really the, the purpose of my my talk is is to try and pull those threads together so the idea of cooperation and technology and starting up a business and sustainability coming together you know, focusing on that major threat to humanity and trying to erode it through our, through our abilities, through our technology, <laughs> is really what we should be trying to do. It's kind of the purpose of coming to this event as well, to strip back that technology, think about it as humans, converse with each other as human beings, and think about those big problems, because ultimately the technologies of the future will be ones that will address that problem. They're the ones that really, really matter. So I'm going to wrap up with a, a bit of a prediction about those technologies. What technologies matter from this point on? What's the future going to look like? There's a lot of different schools of thought on this. This is purely mine. So for me, the first thing is that cooperation, one of the main aspects of cooperation, in any way it worked, was that numeracy and literacy started to play a huge part in cooperation. If we, if we couldn't write things down and store information, we wouldn't have really been able to pass it on and, make, and have that, that effect that I was talking about earlier, the network effect. So... If we fast forward today, numeracy and literacy and the storage of information, it sounds kind of familiar. It's data. Data is, is exactly how we cooperate today. It's the founding sort of uh, system for cooperation. We store data. But our worlds have become incredibly complex. Those, uh, those systems, those stories we've, we've produced have become 
real entities of massive complexity. There's, I don't think anyone in the world, one person in the world that fully understands something like the European Union. It appears no one does. Um, so, and and there's, there's there's no one that fully understands corporate law. You know, these these are these are too complex. So, without being able to reposit that information and make it accessible to other people, and without sharing, uh, you know, access to it, we'd never be able to have these complex systems. So data is going to be one of those threads that's just going to continue to be the baseline of everything we do into the future. Better and better data. But like I said, the complexity now is so extreme that humans, it's almost already surpassed the point where humans can understand that data. We produce this stuff and analyzing it is, apart from you know the superficial level of analyzing it for marketing purposes and that sort of thing, behavioral analytics, it's moving towards computer analysis it's moving towards algorithms and um, that's been going on for, for you know a couple of decades now but it's definitely you know that, that there's that um there's that point when computer technology sort of surpasses us it kind of that's that's been and gone the ability for us to analyze our own data is is, is already surpassed by tech so the other thing that's going to go hand in hand with with data for the future is of course computational power the power to, to process that data store it to gather it in the first place we know these as things like algorithms and artificial intelligence. But artificial intelligence, actually, to me, is, is a layer in that. You have data and computational power pulling all that data together. And artificial intelligence, I mean, again, there are two schools of thought on this. One is Terminator, and the other is mine, which is that it's an interface. It's just a human interface. It's a way for us to interface with the data we're producing, with this incredibly complex stuff that we're producing in a way that makes sense to humans. And that's why it's artificial intelligence, because it mimics our understanding and it responds to it. And so AI, to me, is, is a major thread for the future, but as a, as a dashboard, as a database, uh, a way of accessing data. So those three things in the future are going to be the main technologies, and all other technologies really have to rely on those. They have to plug into them some way. So if you're not thinking about data, computational power, and AI with any advanced technology, if you're starting up a business, definitely need to be but the other thing we need to be thinking about is that the, the technologies that will be most relevant in future the ones that matter to us as a species are the ones that are going to do something about sustainability they're going to reverse the course that we're on because we are on a completely unsustainable course so this brings me back to my original point about these sort of pivot points in history this seminal moment in the human story and i think that the, the moment we're at now is one of those because without a change a significant right angle change of direction we're in trouble and so technology and our innovation and our cooperation to me are the tools by which we're going to achieve that and uh that's it for me thank you <laughs>